Hey everybody, today we are going to be talking about movies that uh, maybe we really liked the first time we saw them and then we saw them again maybe years later. I don't know. And uh, it didn't quite hold up the way that you remembered. I have a million examples of these, way too many to name. And I think it says a lot about just kind of the way you move on in your life, the way things change for you, the way your perspective changes or doesn't change. All that can kind of factor in. Obviously it has to do with maybe your mood, the point in your life. And I think for a lot of us it kind of reminds us how much we've grown up, maybe. I don't know. So we will start with the first one. Schindler's List. When I first saw it I was blown away by the filmmaking and heartbreaking subject matter, but on reevaluating the film I find it surprisingly tame in Hollywood for this kind of story, especially compared to the other war films like Come and See. I think Kubrick said that it didn't work for him because the film is about small success making a difference where the Holocaust is about the ultimate failure of the human race. That pretty much sums up how I feel about it. Not to say it's not well made and certain uh, certain things such as Ray Fine's character are insightful, but overall I think it's too Hollywood. Yeah, and I've talked about Schindler's List many times. I totally agree with you, though I will say for me, I never was a big fan of Schindler's List. The first time I saw it, I admired it, I appreciated it, uh, and I, I feel the same way now, but uh, yeah, it's pretty much kind of stayed the same level for me all through. I've been thinking a lot about Steven Spielberg lately just because, you know, he's having <laughs> this success with the Academy and all of that and, and critically with the, the Fablemans, which, you know, that was a movie that there were things about the film I really liked, but overall it is very kind of, you know, a very soft core type of Spielberg movie that feels very much like it belonged in the 1950s. There's just nothing particularly fresh about it or interesting. There's so many more interesting films and artists that are out there that I think need that push, but instead we're kind of giving it to Spielberg because we see them as this, or we see him as this legend, as, as somebody who has done so much for the industry. So again, it just feels like this is the stuff that you're supposed to give awards, the stuff you are supposed to admire. It's the stuff that adults tell you are supposed to be important. You're like, well, I don't see what's such a big deal about it. And, you know, again, Spielberg used to be the kind of person who made, you know, movies that were very accessible but completely put a spin on them, made them so fresh and interesting back in the 70s. And now he just makes like old studio model movies. But of course, you know, he has all of this uh, acclaim and he has all of this money and power. So, you know, he can he can make really big expensive movies still, even though nobody is seeing them. And yes, it's just this whole thing of making big important movies that are very historical or whatever that I just, I just don't like. And I, I don't like it from Steven Spielberg. I've said that so many times on here, but I think Schindler's List kind of represents that. Uh, when he makes historical films, for the most part, it just feels like he's he's making it from the perspective of a history book and like, you know, he has a suit and tie and he's saying, kids, you better pay attention to your history. It doesn't feel immersive. It doesn't feel powerful. And I don't like it a lot of the time when you do have that perspective in these historical movies. It's so much more interesting to put yourself in the moment. You mentioned Come and See. That's a perfect example. That's a movie where, you know, you're you're right in the middle of the action and you don't see anything outside of that. That to me is much more powerful. I would love to see Spielberg do something more like that, but no, he always plays it so safe and he plays it very much like out of this respect for history and all that stuff. And I just wish he would get drunk at some point and just kind of do something a little bit more um, rebellious or edgy. You know, I know we don't associate him with that, but I, I truly think he has it in him. You know, he is somebody with a lot of grit and a lot of imagination certainly did in the beginning of his career. But yeah, I do look at Schindler's List as the culmination of Spielberg's um, more accessible uh, success and then transitioning into becoming the important uh, Academy Awards type of director. That film is what gave him that respect. And then from there you see kind of a transition into a different type of filmmaker who makes movies that, you know, for the most part do not connect with me on an emotional level like the ones previous in his career. I do agree with you. I think Ray Fiennes uh, is really interesting in the film and I think he's, yeah, one of the best parts about the film and it was one of the more interesting uh, ideas that Spielberg was kind of delving into with that character. Again, too consciously symbolic, you know, even just like the girl in the red coat, I just, it's gimmicky to me. It doesn't move me. It seems we're on the Spielberg hate train today, but uh, the next one is Steven Spielberg's Hook. I grew up loving the movie as much as anyone of my generation. All the more so because it was one of my earliest movie-going experiences that I remember. But now I have to reconcile myself to the fact that it is one of Spielberg's weakest films and it contains examples of some of his worst traits. In Hook, Spielberg mistakes bustle for inventiveness and fuss for wit. He never stops throwing things at the screen for the audience to see whether it be shtick or spectacle or some obnoxious combination of the two. The effect is not unlike that of having too much sugar. You don't feel entertained so much as zapped. And I hate to disparage a film that was made during a time when things were actually constructed rather than green screened. 
but the sets and costumes look exactly like what they are, sets and costumes. Combine that with uh, the Lost Boys looking like they came out of a Hollywood child talent pool, and it's like you're watching the most expensive high school play ever produced. The money spent is there to see, but nothing much else. Spielberg went on record at the time saying he had always wanted to do a Peter Pan movie. It's enough to make you wish that he had kept his ideas solely for the kids' local drama school program. This is spot on. Absolutely spot on. And I say this as a fan of Hook, but I, even when I was a kid, I had a lot of the same complaints that you have. When I was a child, the artificiality of it always bothered me. It always felt like we were kind of walking into some, you know, weird universal theme park ride. And yes, as you said, you know, like the Lost Boys, they look, yeah, like they, they came straight out of their trailers. But it is one of those movies that is, it's a comfort movie for me. It is a guilty pleasure. One of those movies that I recognize is not very good and yet it just, it, you know, it warms my soul because I watched it every, you know, Thanksgiving after the Macy's Day Parade as a child. And as a child, it was the idea of, of course, imagination and Peter Pan and the nostalgia. All of that, you know, certainly plays into the things that children really like. And yes, as you said, it, it bothered me that a lot of the costumes and the makeup just felt very artificial. It was never convincing to me as a child. And yet something about that I kind of liked because it reminded me of like, ooh, you know, the, the stuff I would do as a kid. Like I'm just putting on, you know, costumes and doing my own makeup and it looks kind of silly or whatever. So when I watched that movie, I looked at it in that way and it kind of inspired me to do a lot more like, you know, do-it-yourself type of stuff when it came to uh, playing as a child and inventiveness, imagination. But you are absolutely right in the sense that it's like, it seems like Peter Pan would be the perfect thing for Spielberg to make. Absolutely. Like, if I had been maybe this age and I found out at the time, you know, knowing what Spiel Spielberg was at the time, it's like he's going to make a Peter Pan movie. I'd be so excited. And yet, yeah, I think it just really fell flat on its face. It's just bombastic and overly stuffed. The humor, everything about it feels just incredibly forced. And yeah, for Spielberg, somebody who I think of as you know, creating natural whimsy and, and, and making movies feel so kind of fresh and innocent and powerful, uh, a lot of that did feel choreographed. A lot of that did feel like it was kind of sagging beneath all of the, the bombasticness of everything, as you said, and like the feeling of it's like nausea, like you've, you've had too much sugar or something. And yeah, that's the feeling I get from the film. So while it has its, its things about it that did inspire me as a child, for sure it doesn't work. And it is very sad knowing that, you know, it seems like the perfect sort of thing, knowing that Spielberg has made movies like E.T., Labyrinth, I had a crush on young Jennifer Connelly. The movie, my crush on Connelly, and that cod piece have not aged well. <laughs> yeah, uh, Labyrinth is um, obviously a cult classic of sorts, and um, I mean, Jennifer Connelly's performance certainly has not aged very well. Um, I think Jennifer Connelly is very beautiful, but I know what you're saying. Like, absolutely, her performance and everything about it, just the character that she plays, it's, it's, it's really bad. And the acting is particularly fascinating, especially knowing that Jennifer Connelly is a fantastic actress. I'm not sure exactly what direction she was given here, but um, I will say for myself, I've seen Labyrinth maybe a couple times, and I think part of it is I didn't grow up with it. I didn't see it until I was maybe like 25 or 26 years old. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have that same kind of nostalgia. I don't get that kind of funky feeling when I watch it um, to the same degree. It doesn't connect with my heart. Um, but when I was watching it, I will say, I, <laughs> I think the cod piece has aged well, actually. I think that's one of the better things about it, just kind of that, that campy silliness to it, the cheekiness. Um, and it's David Bowie. I mean, David Bowie is really the only thing about the film that I think really works. He just stands out as something really kind of electrifying, where everything else is feeling very flat and cartoonish. A lot of the effects don't really work. And I really think a lot of the musical sequences are, are really bad, to be honest with you. I, I know that a lot of the songs people consider really catchy and, and everything, but no, I, I think they feel incredibly second rate in a lot of the way they're designed. It's like, you know, especially at the time, knowing the types of movies and musical numbers that were done. Yeah, it just, I, it feels incredibly second rate to me. And I never really got the appeal of it other than just kind of, you know, it's very quirky and strange and, and can be a little bit psychedelic maybe. But I stand by, I think that David Bowie, I don't want anything about him to change that performance. It's, it's, it's fantastic, it's hilarious, it's silly. And I really think that David Bowie is one of the more underrated um, performers in movies. I, I always thought he was really great. Crash from 2005 saw it as an impressionable 13 year old and thought it was the deepest thing in the world, literally revisited it two years later. And I was already old enough to realize how surface level so many of the messages were. My, my experience was kind of similar, but um, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I saw that movie when I was 15 because the movie came out at that age. And uh, I 
I thought it was a masterpiece and I was so moved by it. I thought it was so gut wrenching and I thought the music and everything about it was so. And yeah, now when I watch it, it's like, this is shocking. And it's one of those feelings, that's one of those movies where when I watch it today, I am shocked that I ever liked it in the first place. And I'm kind of wondering, was it the hoopla surrounding it? Like, did I get kind of caught up in, in all of the, uh, you know, like the critical acclaim of it and everything. And the fact that it was, you know, very strange that it became the best picture winner of that year, you know, it seemed to come kind of out of nowhere. That was always very perplexing to people. And you absolutely see why, because when you watch this movie today, it doesn't hold up at all. And when I say it doesn't hold up, I'm not talking about, you know, like politically, anything like that. I'm talking about just, you know, the, the writing of it. Uh, I think it's just, it's so, 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 so hackneyed. It is, it's, it's so like playwright 101 type stuff. And it's going for that Altman kind of like nobody is a main character. It's like a big ensemble and we see kind of the mix of racism and class structure, et cetera, all this stuff. But it's like all of it is done in the most convenient ways. Always going for the gut punch for the melodrama, never really focusing actually on the characters or making any of the themes uh, resonate, making them more complex. Just the recent Mission Impossible franchise, the action gets tiresome as does the whole mask reveal when there is no action. It's like watching a very boring Hallmark movie drama. And as much as I have some issues with uh, the Craig era Bond films, I still see him as Bond, but Cruz is just Cruz in an action movie, which is a shame because he's got a better record for disappearing in costume and makeup than most actors. Interview with a Vampire, Magnolia, Tropic Thunder. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think James Bond certainly as a franchise is, is way better than Mission Impossible. And I think a lot of people would probably agree with that. I mean, James Bond is like a, a much more cohesive character. The world is much more kind of intact and all of that. I've always seen Mission Impossible more as just like a, a Tom Cruise vehicle. I don't think it's trying to be anything else. And so I don't mind what it stands for. Uh, I, but I do agree with you in the sense of like, I don't like the later ones very much. And I, I know they still do very well, but I think a lot of that just has to do with Tom Cruise his star power, as well as how, how good he is at marketing, especially in this kind of third act, this resurgence he has in his career. Uh, but yeah, when you look at original Mission Impossible, it's great because it's Brian De Palma. There is a, a quality to the style of it. And of course, having Tom Cruise at the center. And obviously with the second one, you have John Woo, but you know, at least it, it's still very pronounced as a style. I think, you know, once you get into J.J. Abrams, it's going more for kind of balance and story accessibility. I kind of like the ones, like the fourth one. I, I really enjoyed that one because it was zippy and cartoony. It was always moving and it was always keeping me interested. You know, stuff like that I really enjoyed. After that, I felt like they kind of fell off and they weren't as interesting. I felt like the direction wasn't very good. You talk about how it has kind of like a Hallmark movie drama quality to it. Yeah, there was just something about it where like the transitions weren't very interesting. Nothing about it was really cinematic other than obviously the big set pieces, the big action sequences. Yes, it does feel like more we're making a movie and we're building it around the sequences for Tom Cruise to do the big stunts, which is fine because obviously they make their money that way. It is a franchise. It's, it's meant to be lucrative, I think, more than anything else. Well, entertaining, I should say, is most important, especially to somebody like Tom Cruise, which I appreciate. But um, I mean, I love Tom Cruise and I love that he's having this moment. And I think it's really great, all the things that he's done. And, you know, I've seen the uh, promotions for the new Mission Impossible where he's doing the big stunt. And that's awesome. Obviously, like I look at that, I'm like, well, I'm going to see it. How it's going to work into the movie, I don't know. I get a feeling that the rest of the movie probably won't be that interesting. And it's going to be more about that stuff. It is more about, you know, the Tom Cruise spectacle. But, you know, that's fine. That is kind of what movies have to be these days, unfortunately, uh, more so than ever. But um, yeah, I'm glad you said what you said, because I felt the same way. I remember, um, I think it was like in 2015, whatever uh, Mission Impossible came out that year. I was not a big fan of it just because it, I don't know, it just felt very kind of lukewarm and kind of dull from an aesthetic perspective and all of that compared to the ones um, that had just come out before it. And yeah, so those are a few of your answers. And thank you guys so much for watching the video. I'm going to plug my website. As always, it is deepfocuslens.com. I'm an artist. I do commission portraits and I sell prints of my work. If that is something that you're interested in, you can always go to the website below. And if you have a question about a commission or a print, you can email me. My email is in the description box below as well. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons who are wonderful guys. Thank you so much for your support. If you are interested in supporting, the link for that is below, as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here, and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.